the components, the other thing that's good to know when you're dealing with old British cars is what we have, and there's really not too many, um, there's not too many components that we really deal with. Uh, we've got, you know, the basic, the conductors, that's the wires, the things that the electrons move through. Okay, that's a conductor. Um, an insulator is something that doesn't give up its electrons freely. Rubber, plastic, uh, bake light, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. Um, so we got the conductors, we got the wire, the gauge, the construction of the material. Here's something I want to show you about today's world. We see this all the time. I'll draw this out real quick. If you notice, when you look at some of the old wires, you've got the insulation, and you've got, you know, 50 strands of fine copper wire in there, let's say. And this, they measure wire by gauge. So this dimension to this dimension, let's say we're working on a battery cable and it's a four gauge wire, okay? That's what we had in the old wires. What we got nowadays, when you go to AutoZone and you get one of those cheap battery cables, or you buy one from a supplier and it's a modern one, it's assembled like this. Instead of a hundred strands of fine wire, you might get seven strands of coarse wire. So you notice your new battery cables, they don't flex like the old ones. They're stiffer than stiff. Here's the problem with that. It'll still measure that gauge, but look at all the airspace you've got in between that's not conducting electricity. So the effective capacity of that wire the modern wire that's constructed like this is a lot less than some of the old ones that were constructed like this. You see what I'm saying? There's less copper in the new wires a lot of times. You really have to watch it. Yes? Because the electricity travels down the s surface of the wire, not through it. And the more wire surface you have, the better it will conduct. Exactly. Exactly. And so when you've got all this airspace in there, you don't have the capacity you had. And so what does that cause? That causes resistance to the flow of electricity. When the resistance goes up, what happens? Ohms. Resistance is measured in ohms. When the resistance goes up through those calculations, you can see the amp draw increases. So we see that a lot. A lot of the modern wire. Um, again, I said I'd stay out of opinions, but if you're... If you're doing something and you're not, you know, you want to stay historically accurate, um, you're kind of stuck with what you can get. But for a modern car, you can get better quality wire. Um, you go to like uh, oh, West Marine or some of those places that have a good selection of wire, the aircraft supply places, and you'll get real wire. Here's the other problem with this, and I'm going to try to stay politically correct, but when these battery cables that you get at AutoZone, or, and I'm not picking on AutoZone, at the auto parts store, wherever you get them, that are made in China, they may say copper, but here's where we're going to get into the chemistry. How much <laughs> copper is really in their copper? Okay, different metals are better conductors. Silver is a real good conductor. Gold is excellent. Copper is good. Tin, okay. And then there's junk, okay. So when auto parts store goes to Quang over in China and says, make me this cable for a dollar, and I want it copper, well, what is the spec for their copper? Is it 100% copper? Is it 90? Is it an alloy? You see what I'm saying? We run into that a lot with aftermarket parts. And then what happens? Lucas gets blamed for it. <laughs> using electric uh, welding cables. Those are excellent for battery cables. They're very flexible, multi-strand. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good, really good way. I've ran into some uh, wiring for computers, and they use very fine uh, uh, silver-plated copper wire. So yeah. It's a very good one. Very good quality. Yeah. Yeah. So the conductor is probably our conductors are probably our main component of our system that you're going to deal with. Under a subheading of conductors, then you got the connections. Okay. One of the biggest things we see around here is two wires twisted together with a band-aid for installation. <laughs> Yeah. Or two wires twisted together with a wire nut. Or I had a car come in with the factory wire connected to a piece of Romex out of a house, which is a single conductor, wrapped around with tape on it. Okay. Yeah. 
butt connector. Anytime you make a connection, you're adding resistance. So the best way to do it is like the original harness, source to source. Um, if you don't have it, come see us. We'll make them for you. We have all the factory original connectors, the little bullet connectors. And the important part is we have the correct tool to crimp those on. These, I see so many of these stupid plastic butt splices and they're crimped here and they're crimped there. Well, that crimping, it just doesn't quite do it. It relies on the tension of the crimp to hold the pressure to make contact. And over time, they wiggle. These cars vibrate and they shake and they get loose and you get intermittent connections. And even if they're not intermittent, if you've got resistance there because they're a little corroded and they're not making good contact, there goes your amp draw, and that puts a load on everything else. The original wires were, were all, all those bullets from the factory were soldered on, not crimped on as they with. Yeah, I think originally in years, years they were, and then they were just a crimp, you know. And those, you could plug them in, but you couldn't unplug them. Because <laughs> other than that, the bullet would end up in the connector, and you didn't Yeah, with the, the wire, yeah. yeah. Yeah, what happens a lot of times, you got to be careful when you solder. The solder will wick up the wire, and it forms a hard spot and then that'll flex and that'll snap right off. And that's why a lot of modern cars don't solder. They're all crimped to avoid that work hardening of the soldered connection. But what we do, the best for that, what we do, when we make connections here in the shop, we always try to solder everything and then uh, a good grade of heat shrink tubing over it and that'll lend support to the wire out here so it's not flopping around and working that connection. That's one thing you can do. So back to some of these components. And I'm trying not to bore you to death, I'm sorry. They'll all come together. That's but what we're here for. Okay. <laughs> okay. So switches. We got a lot of switches. I drew a little one out here. This is like the classic rocker switch. And the reason I drew this out, because if you've never seen the internal mechanism of it, it's pretty it's pretty unique, but it's very small. And so what you have here, you got contact surfaces here and here. That'd be represented here and here. When you move this rocker, there's a little spring and a little plunger in here, and it snaps over center and pushes down on that and makes connection. Very, very simple. Again, the original ones you could count on for Lucas. This was a pretty good grade of plastic. It no. was a pretty good grade of copper. Some of these have the little dot on them where they're actually silver plated. Actually, the problem with those switches to begin with is the grade of plastic. <laughs> well, they get old and brittle, you know. You know. What they do is they melt down if you got any resistance at all, any place. <laughs> That ball and that spring melts right down into the, the socket. That's exactly, yeah. see, and here's why, and here's why. This is what I was talking about. This was originally rated to have one amp go across it. Now you're pulling three amps. When that snaps down there, it gets hot, just like he said. The heat transfers right up that piece of copper. Copper's a great transfer of heat. Pots and pans made out of copper. It's the latest thing, right? That heat gets right up here, gets on the spring, you heat a spring up, it's not a spring anymore. It's just a piece of metal. You cut down and you need more pins or so. You just got an extra fuse built right in. You got an extra fuse? And once that happened, then like he said, the little the little white piece in there, that thing melts. That's, That's pretty 68 or newer. Yeah. So now imagine that problem, though. Think of this. Welcome to our world. We buy, supposedly, the best heritage switch. And what do we got going for us? We don't even know what the plastic is. It'll say some modification required because it doesn't really fit the hole. <laughs> and then this little piece here that's supposed to be, say, 10 gauge copper, it's basically aluminum foil. <laughs> okay? I mean, it, it's, it's tough. It, it's a tough world. And then Lucas gets blamed for the bad system. No, I just think that basically the manufacturing, I'd only hope, would get better since the 60s and Instead, all it is is gone backwards to being cheaper. <laughs> well, and okay, and here's, and, and when we look at Lucas Electrics, here's the thing to keep in mind. And like I say, I, I might offend some people by defending Lucas, but you got to remember the era they were in. Okay, the number of cars they built a year compared to say General Motors or Ford, what were they building? Two thousand of some of these cars in an entire year. So their R and D, their research and development, their engineers, if they said, hey. We want to engineer a completely new system. We're going to do this, and it's going to be what ten thousand dollars, which is nothing. If you're only building two thousand cars, that adds fifty bucks to the price of every car you made that year. 
So they didn't have the huge capability to really, that's why they stuck with a lot of the old stuff, you know? And then on top of that, labor problems and everything else they had going on, it was a tough, it was a tough that's road. That's right into all your similarities, because it's either a Triumph or a BMC or whatever. It's they, the, they'd go to the parts was, bin. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Same but it was a blessing switch. for a lot of manufacturers because Lucas made switches that fit virtually every car. Yep. Yeah. You didn't have to engineer it all yourself. The one specific one for some you low production. You'd car around the, the switches that were yep. available or the lights that, that were yep. available. You'd go to the parts bin, you'd find out what's there, what's common, what you could do, and, and go from there. Some of those old switches seem to have held up for years and years. They only get a little corrody after they sit in the garage for too long. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But other than that, putting load on those old switches never never has been a problem. Yeah, yeah that's it's just, just the newer ones that are made out of plastic. Yeah, what we found, excuse me, so you'll have some old switches seem to last for years and then the replacements we get and we try to buy the best quality available, they just don't hold up like the original. It's not there. And I think my personal, you know, I said I wasn't going to talk about opinions, but my personal opinion is I don't think the copper is up to the spec that it was originally. Um, I don't think the spring pressure and some of the contacts are up and it's just, but that's there again. Now you're dealing with reproduction parts and you're going to some manufacturer in China and you're saying, can you make me the switch? And he says, yeah, I'll make you that switch for 37 cents, you know, and uh, that's what you have. I often tell people to tear it apart and see if they can fix it because it's probably better than the new part they're buying. Exactly. We do a yeah, lot of that here. We do. Uh, the Penalite rail stats were made so poorly for MGBs that the act of putting it in the car essentially breaks it. So every time we come across an old Penalite rheostat, we lubricate, take it apart, solder it together because the old stuff is better. So, yeah, yeah I mean, if, if we can recondition stuff, we, we can, but, I mean, there's only a certain point you can take it to. Yeah. And they're cheap to start with. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so those are switches. Um, they'll be on, you know, schematic diagrams depicted a number of different ways. The other thing we deal with, not too much in the old British cars, but for your aftermarket accessories, you should check them out, and that's relays. And if you think about it, you think, well, the old British cars didn't have relays. Yeah, they did. It's called a solenoid. Your starter solenoid is a perfect example of a big relay. How can you power this starter motor that's going to pull 100 amps off of a switch? Well, you can't do it with a dash switch. I'll guarantee you that. Uh, I love Roger's car. This has the original. There's no, there, he has no relay on that car. You pull the cable and it engages the two poles for the starter motor. It's like the early 850s where they had the push button on the floor basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so that's, that's a relay. Basically a relay though usually is electromagnetically activated. So what happens is like if you want to put the big fog lights on your mini, the big driving lights, you want 100 watts of blinding eye searing power out there. Um, and you don't want to run it through a switch. Uh, what the switch does, the switch energizes the relay and then the relay closes and turns on the lights. And that way those contacts are carrying all the load and all your switch has to do is energize a little tiny electromagnet. What's your favorite circuit? relay to use for that situation? Lucas. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Job security, right? I want your second favorite. <laughs> Bosch. Bosch. Yeah, yeah, Bosch. I would go with a Bosch yeah, or something okay. like that. Something calm and get, you know, if you're just making it yourself, you're not concerned about historical accuracy, get something common.